Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I think the colonel is, is, is ready to go. He said he had a long train ride up here from Kentucky. And of course, the train is not air conditioned, you know, because it's 19... Forty-seven. For <laughs> <laughs> it's 1947. August 4th, 1947. <laughs> anyway, welcome everybody. Um, I think you're going to be entertained with history tonight. Um, we hope you can come back in two weeks. I hope you can come back in two weeks because I'm on board, <laughs> so to speak. I'm going to talk about murder, mystery, and mayhem on the Orient Express. Um, I, I tried to pick out incidents and people that maybe you hadn't heard about, but there really was some murder, mystery, and mayhem on the Orient Express. So, hope to see you in two weeks. Um, Ron, do you have something to say? Um, say something anyway. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the next big thing is we're getting ready for the Wyandotte County Fair, so I'll be planning for that. Um, we also have something kind of unique coming up at the beginning of September. We're going to be celebrating uh, Isaac Berry and Leafy Fowler's 170th wedding anniversary. We'll have a, a reception here with some cake and other other things here on that afternoon. So I'm looking forward to going out to the baker and saying, I want a cake that says happy 170th anniversary <laughs> and see the reaction. So. Oh, okay. So we've also got the oh, yeah. gun we raffle. Have, we have a gun raffle going on for, for the museum again this year, and I'm really excited. It's a little bit different. We usually we have guns only, but this year we have a nice gun from Wyandotte Firearms. It's a Kimber 45 ACP, and also the people that don't want to, don't really want a gun, we have a thousand dollar gift certificate to A and A. So I mean, we have either or. The first person drawn gets their choice of what they get, of what they want, and the second person gets the remaining prize. The tickets are 20 bucks, like I'm excited. That means we have only 400 to sell. They're all out to the committee to the, on the board members now. And I think uh, Ron, uh, he does have some to sell tonight. So jump on board, make a contribution to the museum, and possibly win a nice prize too. Thank you. Tell them what the drawing is. Oh, I'm sorry. Veterans Day, November. So we got, we got plenty of time. So. <laughs> Oh, okay, this I don't think this gentleman needs much introduction. I think most people know Fred. Well, it's not Fred, it's the Colonel. I, I shouldn't say that. He probably doesn't know who Fred Malone That's is. That's his code name. But, yeah. <laughs> the Colonel. I'm ready. ready. We're ready. Well, I'm right. My ready. I'm going to get Wait a minute. I put the water out here. I don't need that. You don't have anything put in it, do you? Well, did you have that, something like that in No, I have no idea. It says it's from Niagara. I suppose that's water from the falls, maybe. I don't know. Well, no, I don't need that. I think I can talk loud enough for everybody to hear me. Will Starling my name. Now, I've been called a lot of different things. My actual name is Edmund William Starling. I've called, been called Will. I've been called Ed. Walking around the White House, they used to call me Star. A couple of my co-workers there called me Star. But I like first a little bit to talk about how I ended up where I ended up. Now I'm from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I think I told a couple of you there earlier about that. And if it wasn't for a man by the name of Edmund Alexander Starling, who was also Colonel Edmund Alexander Starling, I wouldn't be here because I'm a daddy. <laughs> now my daddy was a Civil War veteran on the Union side when we grew up in Kentucky, but he was a Union uh, veteran. He was a decorated cavalry officer. And of course he got his title uh, from the, the war. Now, <clears throat> I was born in 1770, 17, oh my God, I didn't have <laughs> I was born in 1875, which was of course 10 years after the Civil War. Now I had a brother in the name of Guy, and I had two sisters who come along a little bit later. My brother two years older than me, and my sisters a little bit younger. Now, when I was four years old, my daddy was running for sheriff there in Christian County, which is Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Anybody ever been there? I mean, you've you been to Hopkinsville? You get a drink there? Good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, so um, my daddy was running for sheriff, Christian County, and uh, lo and behold, he was assassinated. 
uh, right up on the speaker's platform. Uh, don't we, we never did understand why, but he got shot and died. So now here's my mother, my mother Annie. She is left with my brother Will, six, I'm four. I got my sister Annie, and she's two and a baby. Now here's my poor mother with four youngins. Now, when my dad come back from the Civil War, he started a brick factory, a brick plant there in Hopkinsville and, and sold bricks and, and did a lot of work like that. So, after I got out of school, uh, I worked at the brick factory there in the plant, you know, we sold bricks, that's how we made a living. And uh, after I got out of school, uh, I was downtown one day, which wasn't much, about, uh, <laughs> well, you know, crossroads, that was about it. But a fellow come up to me, and he was a deputy sheriff there in Christian County. And he said, uh, "Well, you know," he said, uh, uh, "We need some, we need some more deputies here in town. Things uh, in the county, things are getting a little bit rough." He said, "Would you like to be a deputy sheriff?" Well, I knew I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to college or get a, you know any more of an education because my mother she needed help, she needed help with the kids and make a living. So I said, "Well, I suppose I could do that." And he said, "Well, pays twenty five dollars a month." But uh, you got to furnish your own gun. You got a pistol? I said, no, I don't have a pistol. I got a couple shotguns, you know, we used to coon hunt and things like that. But I didn't have no pistol. He said, well, if you can get yourself a gun, he said, come on back down to the sheriff's office, we'll swear you in. <laughs> so I, you know, I kind of did a few odd jobs, picked up a few extra bucks, and I bought myself a Colt. I always loved Colt. Now I heard you're going to auction off with something called a what? Kimber. Never heard of it. Probably ain't worth a damn. Colt, the only, Colt, the only good gun they ever made. So I got myself a Colt, and I went on down to the sheriff's office, and, and uh, they swore me in. Now, we didn't have uniforms like they got now, you know, what too fancy. We'd just wear our old dungarees and, you know, whatever we had, and they give you a badge, and I had my own Colt. So that was, that was my first job, and I kind of liked that job, really. The only problem was when you're a deputy sheriff in a small county, you know everybody, and they all know you. I suppose it's probably like that here in this Wyandotte County too, right? The poor people that have to feed up the sheriff and the sheriff. So I, I had to figure out a way that I could go out when I had to serve a warrant or if I had to go out and arrest somebody because I knew I was going to know who it was when I run across him. So there was one time I, I knew this guy, old Henry, and he, he had a he was a good old boy, he really was. He had a family, he had four or five kids, and they lived out on the holler. And, and he had a tendency of drinking too much, you know, on a, on a Saturday night. Well, this one night down at the, down at the uh, side cap, he, he drank just a little bit too much and, and got in a fight and tore the place all up. <laughs> and so, of course, the owners, they wanted some money to pay that, all the damage. And, and, of course, he hightailed back to the holler and took off, you know. So <clears throat> they sent me out after him. Well, now here's the problem. I had a warrant, and I had a coat, but he had a whole bunch of guns in his house. Uh -huh. So I had to figure out a way, and this is kind of, kind of laid out my life. I had to figure out a way that I could do this peaceable life, because, you know, I'm going to get shot. You know, who does? So I, I mosey on out there, and I, I just knock on the door, and he comes to the door. Hey, Henry, you got a couple minutes? I want to talk a little bit. So we sit down at the kitchen table there, you know, and we get a little shot here and have a little drink, and... We're talking around. I said, you know, Henry, I said, uh, you've got a great family here. you got four kids. They're all nice. you got a really nice wife. I said, uh, but you had a little trouble down hunting. You know, uh, last Saturday, you kind of got a little bit uh, a little bit too much to drink, tore the place up, and uh, we got a problem here. He said, now, wouldn't you, wouldn't, you, uh, wouldn't you like to come on down to the jail and maybe just kind of get your time served out of the way, and then you got this problem behind you? there for a minute he thought he said well you know well he said i think that's probably a pretty good idea let's just do that so we went down we put him into jail and he served his time and paid the debt and everything was fine so i was, I was a deputy sheriff for oh let's see uh, about 1898 the spanish american war started to break out well i thought bam i gotta go get on with teddy roosevelt i want to join up with the rough riders so i go to bowling green now i'm talking about Bowling Green, Kentucky, not Ohio, right? Mm -hmm. So I go to Bowling Green, sign up with the Rough Riders, and I run into another buddy of mine from Hopkinsville, and he said, you know, Will, he says, uh, I know you want to join up with the Rough Riders, but um, did you ever think about going back home? They're forming a National Guard there, and we could really use the help. He'd already signed up, you know, so he kind of pulled me in. So I said, well, that, that don't sound like too bad of an idea. So we, we go on back down, I sign up, and I get in the National Guard, and they knew I had a good prowess with guns, 
and I could teach other people. So I ended up sticking around there in that particular area and I helped to train the boys on how to shoot. And most of them ended up going to Cuba. Now, I never did get to Cuba. I never did get to fill out my dream of going to, you know, join up Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. But I did serve my country uh, in the Spanish-American War. You know, and I kind of I kind of developed a sense of, um, I kind of like Teddy Roosevelt a little bit, you know. Uh, I always wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. You know, you ever hear Teddy say that? Yeah, he wanted to be the bride at all the weddings and the corpse at every funeral. I kind of got that way myself. So anyway, I, I got done with the service, and uh, uh, I got word that um, the Louisville and the Nashville Railroad was looking for agents to work on the railroad. I thought, well, you know, maybe that's something I could try, because I, like, I kind of got used to carrying a gun, you know, and I had like, what, what are you doing out there, honey? You come on and sit down. There's probably a chair. I'm fine standing. Thank you. You what? I'm fine standing. Thank you. You're all right? I am. Well, I hate to see a good-looking young lady stand there in the only place to sit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if I sit down lazy, you can sit on the lap. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyway, where was I? Uh, oh, yeah, Louisville and Nashville Railway. So I go down and I talk to the head guy down in Birmingham, Alabama, about could I get on the Louisville and Nashville Railroad as a, as a detective or an agent, whatever they call them at that time. I think we called them agents, if I remember right. I'm 72 years old now, and I don't remember it too good. You know? <laughs> I, I think I do have all the socks and things on there. Anyway, uh, so I got the job working with the Louisville and the National Railway. And what I was doing, they had me guarding a special shipments that would come into Birmingham, Alabama. That was kind of a dangerous uh, uh, line where all the trains come together. I forget what they call that now, but uh, it, it was a big hub. That's the word I'm trying to get. And so uh, I worked there for, uh, well, let's see. Uh, I guess that was about 19 and... About 19 and 14 that I was still there and we was doing a special detail with some uh, Secret Service agents to come down from Washington and uh, there was a, 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 a some congressmen and, and some senators and some other you know up the ups muckies <laughs> come down and so they asked if I would help to, to guard these fellers and I said well sure you know whatever I need to do to help my country so uh, in the process I got to meet this fellow who was in charge of this detail. And he was a Secret Service man from Washington, D.C. And uh, he kind of liked the way I handled myself. And, and uh, he kind of started doing a little bit of inquiries, you know, at the L&N Railway and, and a little bit of background and finding out about me, where I come from, what I did, and all that type of thing. And, and after uh, this detail got complete down there, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, uh, um, would you like to come work for the Secret Service? And I thought, well, I don't know. What would I have to do? And he said, well, um, you're pretty much, uh, right now we're dealing with a lot of counterfeiting going on. There was kind of a lot of counterfeiting money going around about that time. And uh, he said that we kind of handle that too. He said, now there is details that, that uh, guard the President of the United States and some other dignitaries, but uh, you'd have to start out at a lower level. But it's possibly, you know, with your age and all that, that you might eventually work your way up. So I thought, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. And since I was only making $50 a month working for the LN, what he was offering was $75 a month. Well, that's a $25 increase right there. Now, I never got married. In all my career, I never got married. Now, I had a wedding ring on, but this was my pappy, so I wear this because he was assassinated, as I said earlier. And uh, I, I took care of my mother all my life. Now, God rest her soul, she just passed away a few years ago, but... but uh, uh, when I take my vacation from Washington, I always went down to visit my mother, and uh, I wrote my mother every day. Now, don't all of you go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> thank you very much, I appreciate that. <laughs> but uh, I never did get married. Uh, I kind of like made, uh, made uh, my career, I was real kind of like married to my career. So for the first couple of years with the service, uh, that's about 19, I think I started with them about 1912, if I remember right. Oh, hey, 1912. Was that an election or what? Wow. Teddy Roosevelt had fallen out with William Howard Taft. Y'all remember that? Yes? Well, William Howard Taft was Teddy's hand-picked candidate to run for president when he was done, you know, in 1908. Well, now, Bill... He's a high boy. 
he didn't quite live up to what Teddy thought he should be a doing. In fact, he he uh, he, he fired Gilbert Pincho. You knew who Gilbert Pincho was? Took care of the national parks and all. He was a big, good friend. So that didn't set well with, with Teddy, and uh, so they had a bit of a falling out. Well, you know, after Teddy, after Teddy got out of the president, he decided he wasn't going to run again. After he left the presidency, uh, he he got to thinking, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said I wasn't going to run after I got elected before that. Kind of stepped out of tune and, and made a wrong statement. But uh, anyway, that, that was water under the dam. He already did that. But come around 1912, Teddy decided that maybe he ought to throw his hat in the ring. So he uh, knew that he probably couldn't get the Republican nomination against a sitting president, you know. So he wasn't going to do that. Bill already had that, had that sewed up. So he formed the Progressive Party. You all remember the Progressive Party? They called it the Bull Moose Party. Remember that? Okay. So, so you got the Progressive Party, you got the Republican Party, and then you got Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of Princeton University and then the governor of New Jersey. Remember? So he was going to be the Democratic candidate. Well, the whole thing backfired. Roosevelt split the vote. He got more votes than Taft got, and it put Wilson in the White House. So here comes 1914. Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1914. I got my son. Guess where I was going? The White House. Yeah, you bet. I'm going to the White House. I'm about as scared as a coon dog on hunting night. You know what I mean? Oh, my. I was shaking in my boots because now I'm going to guard the president. Now, my boss says to me, he says, now, I'm telling you, Will, here's one thing you're going to have to always remember. Never, never take your eyes off the president. I never forgot that. Never take your eyes off the president because that is your responsibility. So here I am, December 24th, 1914, I'm heading for the White House. I get there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, President Wilson is not a very happy man. Why isn't he a happy man in, in December of 1914? Anybody here know? His wife died. His wife passed away in October, just a couple of months before that. So I walk into a White House that is as somber as church on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Maybe even worse than that, Hopkinsville. But anyway, so there I am with President Wilson. Now, i got to tell you something about President Wilson. Lovely man, probably the most, one of the most intelligent presidents we've had up to this time. That man could go through more paperwork in a shorter period of time than anybody I ever saw. His desk could be stacked this high with paperwork in the morning. And by noon, he had it all cleared out and had stacks for the secretaries and the underlings to take care of and, and that quick. But I mean, you had to think about that. He was an educator. He ran Princeton College. Now, I don't think he was much as the governor of New Jersey, but he was a Democrat. Now, I'm a Democrat. Whatever you might want to say about that, I'm Scotch-Irish and I'm Presbyterian. So that's like having one, two, three strikes against you just out the gate. But he and I got along real well. Now, now, the only thing about him was he um, he had no activities because he lost his wife and he was he was in a depression. He was really in a depression. I mean, I never seen a sadder man until until Herbert Hoover came along. Boy, that's another story. We'll probably get to that too. But anyway, he was just a sad man. He he loved his wife. He lost his wife in October. Here's Christmas. He didn't go to celebrate Christmas. Well, just so happened that they had some friends in over the next few days, and uh, he met this woman by the name of Galt. Anybody ever hear of Mrs. Galt? So anyway, he kind of struck up a conversation with her, and uh, they seemed to hit it off pretty good, you know? And uh, so over the next several months, why, they started keeping pretty good company. Hmm. Now, uh, up until that time, uh, Mr. Wilson, he, he, he really didn't have much activity. He was a small man. He was, he was thin. He never ate much of anything. I mean, he just constantly worried about everything. And, uh, but she kind of put a sparkle back in his life, you know. And I think, I think the man was just so lonely that that's what he needed, you know. He needed someone to put the spark back in his life. So, of course, my duty was to stay with him all the time. We worked 12-hour shifts, me and Jensen, my partner, 
and we would switch. Sometimes I would take the morning shift, he'd take the afternoon and evening shift. And we work seven or 12 hours a day. So I'd come in at six in the morning, leave at six at night. We're coming in at six at night and work overnight. Now I kind of like that night shift. That was good because things were quiet and I could room around the White House. And when I got to Washington, I'm kind of backtracking here a little bit. When I got to Washington, I didn't know exactly where I was going to live because they didn't really at that time have quarters in the White House for us or in that particular area for us. So I ended up living 15 blocks from the White House in a, in a boarding house. And that was that was kind of expensive. That was costing me two dollars a day, and uh, you know, you know, I'd get seventy-five dollars a month, but two dollars a day, that, you know, for my keep. Now I got my meals. That's okay, but I had to walk fifteen blocks to get to the White House every morning or every evening when my shift come. But anyway, uh, President Wilson, after he started uh, 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 keeping company with Edith, uh, you could just see a change in the man. Uh, he was. He would like. He wanted to go out and walk, uh, not with me necessarily, but with her. <laughs> of course, I had to walk behind him because that was my job. I think that irritated the hell out of him sometimes because I was always there and he, he couldn't really do what he wanted to do. But uh, <laughs> but they started the walking and and, and uh, they uh, they uh, ride bicycles and uh, then they decided they'd take up golf. Now President Wilson, he never played golf before, and I don't think he did either. Because when we go to the golf course, they both stunk. Uh, he, he'd shoot about 150 and she'd shoot about 200 after nine holes. And she used, she used a, a niblet. Y'all know what a niblet is? Yeah, you golfers know what a niblet is? She used the same damn club all the time. I mean, for hitting everything, putting, the whole, the whole thing. Of course, it didn't make much difference. I don't think they was really there to improve their golf score or really to play golf. They just want to be together. But that was a perfect situation for, for him because you could see a change in that man. I mean, he went from the, uh, being a, a depressed individual to, uh, you know, lighting up uh, with Mrs. Gold. Uh, and so eventually, to make a long story short, they, they got married in October of the next year. Now, that caused some problems. How's that? Well, his wife hadn't been dead but a year. And now here's the President of the United States getting married again. Now, isn't that a scandal? I said, bull. If it makes him happy, it makes him happy. And he was a happy man. Now, as things started to come along, uh, things were starting to get a little bit rough. And uh, if I don't uh, look at my notes, I'm going to get lost as to where I was here. See, I want to talk a little bit about the war. Um, the war started, uh, things, uh, World War I broke out in Europe. And, of course, President Wilson, he was a pacifist. Uh, he, he was trying to keep the peace as best he could, and Congress was starting to get on his ass about it. Pardon, my, pardon me. Uh, <laughs> you have to remember, I was in the service for 30 years. Uh, but anyway, um, he was trying to keep the country out of the war, but the Congress kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him, and, uh, you know, they wanted him to declare war, and he, he just couldn't, he couldn't give up the ghost. Well, of course, uh, when the sinking of the Lusitania came along, that kind of changed his tune just a little bit. And uh, I used to write my mother a letter every day, and uh, I think I might, my mother, God rest her soul, she saved every letter I ever wrote her. When she passed away and I went down to clean out her house, uh, I, I could not believe uh, what all that she had kept. She just kept more stuff than, than you could imagine. And I might not even have one of that letter with me. But anyway, uh, <coughs> I told my mother at the time, I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think we're going to end up in war. And of course, you all know what did happen. We ended up going to war. Fortunately, it didn't last for us as long as it did for the folks in Europe. And by the time the war was over, or near the time that the war was over, uh, you could see a cha another change in President Wilson come along. And his, his health uh, started to fail. Um, I want to read you here. If I have it, I think I have it, maybe I don't. <coughs> Pardon me, folks. Yeah, I don't have it. Anyway, when we were out in uh, New Mexico, and the president was going to give a talk. 
And uh, they had set him up to speak at a coliseum out there. And he come to me that afternoon, and I could tell that there was a change brewing in him. And I said to him, I said, uh, Mr. President, we're going to be heading down to uh, Phoenix, uh, or not Phoenix, uh, Pueblo, uh, for you to give a speech today. He said, well, who, who arranged for this talk? And I said, well, I don't know, somebody on your staff, I suppose. And he said, well, uh, whoever the dumb son of a bitch that did that ought to be horse with. And I'd never heard the man say anything like that before. And it really kind of caught me by surprise. And there was just a look about him that day. Just, it, it absolutely wasn't right. So we get in the car and we head to Pueblo and we get there and when he started up on the stage, I kind of noticed a little bit of a stumble with him. And I grabbed his arm because I thought he was going to fall backwards onto the floor. And I helped him up and he went ahead and gave his speech, but I could tell when he was done with his speech that there was definitely something wrong with him. There was something in his face that just didn't look right. We got on the train that night to start back from Washington. The next morning, when I went for my duty at six, uh, Jensen came out and said that the doctor had been in with the president and it appears that he has had a stroke. And <clears throat> I could tell when I went in, he was, in, he was dressed with a dressing gown on and he was laying on a sofa, Mrs. Gulf and Mrs. Wilson was sitting there beside him. And I said something to him, I said, I, I, if I recall, I said something to the effect that, uh, Mr. President, I'm certainly sorry to hear uh, about your problem, and I said, I'll pray for you. Of course, again, he knew that I was a good uh, praying Presbyterian, uh, so, you know, he knew that come from my heart. And when he smiled at me and said, thank you, I appreciate that, I could see that the one side of his mouth was a drooping a little bit. So definitely, he had that stroke. Now, Mrs. Gall, uh, Mrs. Uh, Wilson, I keep wanting to call her Mrs. Gall. Uh, Edith, uh, uh, she didn't want anybody to see him. Um, so she basically kept him away from the public eye for the remainder of his term. Uh, she has been criticized many times uh, of trying to be Mrs. President, but I want to tell you that there wasn't any better woman that attended to a man when that woman attended to President Wilson. Uh, she was uh, she was going to make sure that he recovered. And he did recover well enough that uh, he was able, uh, when his term was over, he was able to attend uh, the inauguration uh, of Warren Harding. Uh, but uh, God rest his soul, he was a great man. And the country was lucky to have him at the time that they had him. Even though uh, he had his critics in Congress, and in the Senate, uh, he was right doing what he did at the time he did it. Now, that brings us to uh, my number two man here. Now, see, I had, I had Wilson, I had Harding, I had Coolidge, I had Hoover, and I had FDR. Now, I was in that White House for 30 years. I was with the service for 32 years, but in the White House for 30 years. The only man at least up till today, that served five U.S. presidents. Now, I thought right from the beginning that we was going to have a problem with Harding. Number one, he had a little bit of a checkered past, if you all know what I mean. <laughs> and he really didn't want to be president. Uh, he, he, he was happy where he was in the U.S. Senate. He was senator from Ohio. He liked to play golf every day. He liked to have his poker parties and, and his drinking parties and his cronies from Ohio. Y'all y'all heard what they were called, the Ohio, the Ohio gang. That's pretty much what they was. They was a gang, I want to tell you. There were some pretty shabby looking guys in there. Especially that Harry Doherty from down Washington Courthouse. I don't know about that guy. I think he was a little crooked. But he was the one that kind of wanted to make Harding president. Uh, you remember when McKinley was, uh, was the governor of Ohio? There was a man by the name of uh, Mark Hanna that uh, kind of took up the mantle and wanted to put McKinley in the White House. Well, Harry Doherty, he kind of took up the mantle and wanted to put Harding in the White House. Now, Harding kind of struggled lucky because uh, the first time Harry Doherty laid eyes on him, he said, now that is a president. Y'all seen the picture of Harding? He was very presidential looking, wasn't he? Yeah, he really was. 
And that, that worked to his advantage in 1920. Why is that? Why did that work to his advantage? Your lady, why, why did that work to his advantage? Because the women could now vote. You were right, absolutely. And Florence was a pushing him just as hard as she could <laughs> to be president. And the women were voting, and by golly, he won that election, we all know. But now here, I thought I was going to have a problem because I heard right off the bat, right after election day, by the way, I'm riding on the running board to the car with him and Florence going down for the, uh, the inauguration in March. Colder than hell that morning. And I don't even have an overcoat on. Got, I got a hat, but that's it. But anyway, um, I, I knew we were going to have a problem because Jensen told me, my buddy, my partner all those years, Jensen told me, he said, uh, I think Harding's going to ask to, to get you reassigned. He said, well, actually, he said, I, I think it's Mrs. Harding that wants to get you reassigned. I said, well, what is the problem? I don't even, you know, I haven't even had any time with him. She said, he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I think I think I got, I know what the problem is. I just might as well come around and tell you. You're Scotch Irish, you're Presbyterian, and you're a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could, you know, what am I going to do? I am who I am. I'm not going to change my, you know, like a skunk, I can't change my stripe. So, I just thought I'm going to keep doing my job, and, and uh, if I get reassigned, I get reassigned. Well, as it happens, Harding was a good Mason. He belonged to Masonic Line of Mary, and he was a good Mason. And through the grapevine, somehow, he found out that when I was working for the LN Railway down in Birmingham, Alabama, I had saved a life of a man that I didn't know, but I saved the life of a man that was a close personal friend of Warren Harding's. And he put the bug in his ear that you better hang on to starving because he's going to take care of you. Well, I kept my job. I was safe, at least for another four years, at least I thought. So, Harding's in the White House. Return to normalcy. After World War I, things are going to be all hunky-dory, which they were, pretty much. I mean, things were settling down, people were working, uh, things were status quo, uh, Harding, he liked to play golf during the week, so we, we went golfing every day. He liked to play the uh, Chevy Chase Country Club down there. He didn't play the congressional course, he liked Chevy Chase. and. Uh, Sundays, he played golf. I don't know when he got his work done, quite frankly, because he played golf six days a week. I don't play so damn much golf in all my life. Well, I never actually played. Uh, I just, you know, was there guarding him. And I'll tell you one thing about Harding and his golf, he cheats. <laughs> <laughs> Serious, he cheats. And, and if it wasn't him cheating, he'd make me cheat for him. <laughs> you know, if the ball was over here and he didn't like it, I had to kick it over there. And here's why he cheated. They was always gambling when they was playing. Man loved to gamble. Oh my word. He, he loved to gamble. Drink, loved to drink. They drink on the golf course. They drink in the White House. They have poker parties. They drink for them. Smoke, smoke like theme. Love cigarettes, smoke cigars. I don't know when the man got his work done. Honest to God, I don't. Then come June 1923. Well, actually, it's a couple months back before that. He decides he wants to take a, a trip to Alaska. You all know about the Alaskan trip. So he hadn't been too awfully well uh, up to that time. Uh, he put on quite a bit of weight. It ain't no wonder as much as he drank. Uh, but he put on quite a bit of weight. And uh, Dr. Boone, who was a Navy doctor that was uh, in charge of the, the president in the White House. Of course, Dr. Sawyer was there too. He had to stick his nose in everything that was going on. I didn't like that little squirrely guy. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Boone uh, had been treating him uh, for, uh, well, we'd call it today for uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, so anyway, when they planned this trip to Alaska, uh, none of us in the service thought that it was going to be a good, very good idea because he didn't look good at all. I mean, really, he, he didn't look good. Uh, he ballooned up. Um, I think the pressure of the job had gotten to him. I think Florence was on his 
butt all the time about something or another. Uh, of course, he had all those problems at Miriam with some of the women that he co-ended with a little bit. Uh, so things just didn't look good. So we started cross country on the train. We're heading up to Alaska. First sending president to be the territory of Alaska. And uh, he's doing his best. I got to give him that. He's out there giving speeches and shaking hands and, you know, being the strict politician and all that. And so we get to Alaska and we're touring the, the state and you can just kind of see him going downhill all the time. And of course, there's always been the rumor that uh, Florence had, had enough, so she poisoned him. Well, that ain't true. I mean, a lot of people still think it is, but but uh, he, he just, he just, it was his heart. You could just tell that the man wasn't good. And there's been also the story about that he ate some bad clams. You ever hear that one too? Yeah, he ate some bad clams. She's trying to poison him. Uh, maybe his love lives were catching up with him. I don't know. But and then that book that got written, that was that was a problem. But but uh, by the time we get to San Francisco, to the San Francisco Hotel, the man is so sick that he could barely walk. But God bless him. He's the president of the United States, and he said, "I'm going to go in that hotel." on my own power and he did he got out of that car and he walked into the hotel they took him up to the presidential suite and he collapsed but he put on a good front we wanted to take him to san francisco general hospital but he wouldn't have it he wouldn't have it he said nope take me to the hotel because that's where i'm going so we took him to the hotel and he lingered for several days now i was out in the hallway on the morning of his demise and with my i had the morning duty and Mrs. Harding was reading a newspaper to him, and Dr. Sawyer and Dr. Boone were both in the room. I think Dr. Sawyer was laying across the bottom of the bed. He was a lazy son of a bitch. Never cared for him. Uh, or did I say that before? <laughs> anyway, they were both in there, and I heard Mrs. Harding yell, He's gone! And I opened the door and went in. And she looked at me and she said, Starling, he's gone. He's gone. And of course, both of them are, are attending to him. And he had really a very pleasant look on his face. Uh, they said she was a reading to him from the newspaper. And he was just enjoying what she was a reading. And all of a sudden, he grabbed his chest, let out a sign. That was it. He was a gone. He was, he was gone. So, of course, Back we come, back to Washington, and then back to Marion for the funeral. He was uh, he was laid a corpse there in his father's house. His, uh, his father George was a was a physician. His mother uh, was a physician too. Uh, both graduated from uh, Cleveland College of Osteopathic Medicine. But uh, he's laid out a corpse there, and uh, the day of the funeral. Uh, after they've taken him out to the receiving vault out in the Marion Cemetery. Anybody ever been out to the receiving vault there at the Marion Cemetery where he laid corpse until they got to Memorial Hill? Um, Mrs. Harding come up to me and this really shocked me. This, this really shocked me. She come up to me and she said, Starling, uh, I want you to stand at the gates until everybody leaves and make sure that things are locked. And that touched me because I never thought she liked me at all, especially after the comments that, that I heard that she made about me. But apparently, <clears throat> apparently I, I must have touched a nerve with her somewhere because we did, uh, we did get along there at, at the end. Of course, she went back to Washington after the ceremony, uh, ceremonies was over there. And uh, now Calvin Coolidge, uh, my favorite president, Calvin Coolidge uh, was up in Vermont. He was vice president. He was up in Vermont visiting his father, and they lived way out, way out, even further out than what Hopkinsville, Kentucky would be. I mean, they lived out in the boonies. They had no electricity, they had no running water, nothing. And so they had to send a couple of agents. I didn't go. They had to send a couple of agents up to let him know that now that Hardy had passed away and he was, he was president and he needed to be sworn in. Well, his father was a justice of the peace in that particular county up there. And so, if you can picture this in your mind now, you gotta, you gotta think about this. Uh, we got these two agents going up, and I think there was a couple of cabinet secretaries that went too, trudging back into the boonies where this house is, and it's like three in the morning, 
and now knocking on the door, and here comes his dad, his father, down with a coal oil lamp to open the door, you know, and here's these men standing there. We're, we're so-and-so, Secret Service agent, and this is Secretary of the Treasury or whatever. I can't remember who all went there. But anyway, uh, we need to see uh, uh, Mr. Coolidge uh, immediately. Uh, so his son goes upstairs, his father goes upstairs, and he brings old Calvin down. Of course, here comes Calvin in his night shirt with a sleeping hat on, <laughs> on his head. And they inform him that he's now President of the United States, but he has to be sworn in. Now, they can have an official swearing-in ceremony <clears throat> later on, but he has to be sworn in right now, according to the Constitution, he's got to be taken care of. So his father being a notary public, or a justice of the peace, uh, he delivers the oath of office to his son <laughs> in the parlor by coal oil lamp. After he says, I do, or I solemnly swear that I will do, they all turn around and go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> now, Calvin Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge, most interesting man I ever met. What time is it? <clears throat> oh, boy. Calvin Coolidge, one of the most interesting men I ever met. One of the funniest people you'll ever want to know. And, and, and no one realizes that because they called him, what they call him? Anybody know what they call him? Silent cow. Silent cow. Yeah. They, they, this is funny. We're at a dinner. I'm getting ahead of myself. I've got to tell this story. We're at a dinner. And this is one of these big swanky state dinners, you know, there in the, in the blue room or the red room or one of them rooms. I, I, get, I get them all mixed up. But anyway, we're in one of these rooms, state dinner. There's a, uh, there's a lady sitting on one side of him and uh, Miss Coolidge on the other. And this lady's husband's sitting there. About halfway, th and of course, I'm behind the president, where I'm supposed to be. What did I say, Aaron? Sure. Never take your eyes off the president. So I'm going to do my duty. So I'm standing there, and I hear this woman turn to him. She says, Mr. President, I just bet my husband that I could get you to say three words. Calvin looks at her, and he says, you lose. <laughs> uh, now that's the kind of humor the man had in his office in the White House he liked to push all the buttons on his desk and then hide behind the door and wait for all the Secret Service men and the secretaries and everybody else to come running and then he'd jump out from behind the door and say boo <laughs> that's the kind of guy he was he was so funny he liked to walk early in the morning Six o'clock every morning, I had to be there to take him on his morning walk. And he would walk all over Washington. Now, can you imagine? He would just walk all over Washington. I'd be with him, you know. And he never had any money. Never had a dime. And I remember one morning, where he liked to window shop, too. He, he, he was a window shopper. And, and he always walked with his head down like this, you know. And I once said to him, I said, you know, Mr. President, if you hold your head up, you'd see a lot more. And he said, well, you know, I'm always a looking at your shoes because they always got a shine on them. Strange. But anyway, he liked the window shop. He liked the window shop. And we'd be out of walking, and, and, and he'd, he'd see uh, a hat in the window, and he'd say, Starling, make a note of this place and that hat, and send somebody down later to buy that uh, for Grace. I wanted to have that hat. But he never had any money. And we'd be walking along, and he'd say, Starling, you got any money? I'd say, yeah. He'd say, give me 10. I'd say, $10? He said, no, 10 cents. I want to get a paper. <laughs> so I'd give him the 10 cents, and he'd get a paper. And later in that day, there'd be an envelope with my name on it, laying on my little desk that I sat at with my dime in there. You know, I'm <laughs> sure he gave me my dime back. But he was a great guy for doing things like that. He he just uh, he, he he loved to uh, to play practical jokes, and and you know uh, I I didn't mention uh, this. I ain't got enough time, you know. Uh, he he, uh, he had a pet raccoon. You ever hear about his pet raccoon, Rebecca? He had a pet raccoon named Rebecca, and and that raccoon liked to ride on his shoulder. So he, he'd be walking around the White House with this raccoon sitting on his shoulder. It wouldn't matter who was there. There could be a head of state there from some place, you know. But
But no, there was Rebecca sitting right up there on his shoulder. Yeah, he was a great guy. I love, I love Calvin. Yeah. They had a lot of good times. In fact, we had decided he, he wasn't going to run for it. You know, he took over Harding's term, finished that last year and a half of Harding's term, then won on his own. And he could have run another term. But he, he chose not to run. Uh, he wanted to go back home. And we had basically decided that I would retire from the service and go with him. Uh, we had become very, very close friends. I taught him how to fish. He never knew how to fish before. Uh, he was always afraid to get in the boat. Uh, and of course, we'd get out in the boat and be him and I, and I'd stand up in the boat, you know. Like, <laughs> you'd see the blood just rush out of his face and get all nervous and upset. But he loved to fish. Uh, now, now, well, we'll talk about him in a minute if we've got enough time. But uh, anyway, uh, we decided we were going to do that. And uh, after uh, uh, Hoover was inaugurated and uh, the Coolidges were heading back home, we, we laid our final plan. I said, well, I can't. I can't go right away because i got duties here at the White House. i got to take, you know, i got to get through first uh, presidency, and uh, then I'll, I'll retire and I'll come on up. Well, before I could do that, he died. And we never had an opportunity to do that. Now, Herbert Hoover, can I go an extra five minutes or so? Sure. Yeah. So anyway, Herbert Hoover, what a poor man. You know, he was a very intelligent man. When he was Secretary of Commerce under Coolidge, um, you wouldn't want a better cabinet secretary than him. He, he, he just, he was a smart, he was a very intelligent man. Uh, and of course, he was inaugurated in March of 29. And uh, of course, you all know what happened. Uh, things were going along great the first six months. Um, wasn't really anything major happening in the country, and then all of a sudden the crash, stock market crash. And you could see a change in that man from one day to the next uh, in, in what took place. Uh, now, Christmas Eve, uh, 1929, they decided to have a party uh, and invite a lot of children in. Uh, there was congressmen there, there were senators there, uh, and they was all having a good time. We had the, the Marine Band was a plan, and a uh, big Christmas tree. Uh, everyone was in a celebratory mood. Um, you know, you, it was just a season. It was just a season. It was Christmas. Uh, even, us, uh, even us old Secret Service agents was having a good time that night. And all of a sudden, one of the other agents come running in the room, and said, the president's office is on fire. You ever hear about this? He said, the president's office is on fire. And so, of course, we, we all run outside. And at that time, somebody called the, the D.C. Fire Department. The fire department was there. And the, the entire Oval Office was aflame. The flames were shooting out the roof 30, 40 feet in the air. And we, was, we was really afraid it was going to burn down the whole White House. And I mean, White House hadn't been burnt down since the War of 1812 when the British did it. And they did it on purpose. But here's the whole place is on fire. So we got the kids outside and got all the people out. We're all standing there watching them put the fire out. They did finally get it out. The president's son actually run in to the Oval Office and was clearing out the papers in his dad's desk so they wouldn't catch a fire and be destroyed. But it completely destroyed that Oval Office room. And it had to be totally restored. And President Hoover paid for the entire restoration of that Oval Office, costing $65,000 in 1929. That was a lot of money. But that was a bleak thing that happened. So here's this poor man. He gets sworn in in March. The stock market crashes in October. And on Christmas Eve, his office burns up. It costs him $65,000 of his own money to put it back. So, not much to say about Hoover. It was a humdrum job the entire time that uh, I was with him. Um, he was, uh, he, he tried his best. I mean, he really did. Uh, they, they created Hoovervilles. You all remember what Hoovervilles from your history in school, uh, where they tried to, to provide a place for people to work because people had nothing. 
and they'd have jobs, they, they'd have money, there were soup lines, they were setting up tents, Lafayette Park, all around the country, and they called all these settlements Hoovervilles, and they blamed President Hoover on the entire thing, and it really wasn't anything that he could have done any different. So his term ends, and happy days are here again. <laughs> Here comes Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> now, y'all know, or maybe you don't, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was on the ticket in 1920. Y'all know that? Yep, some of you are shaking your head. In 1920, Warren Harding is a runner for president on a Republican ticket. Calvin Coolidge is his vice presidential candidate. He is the editor and the owner of the Marion Star. His opponent is from Dayton, Ohio, a fellow the name of James Cox. He's a Democrat, and he is the owner and the editor of the Dayton Daily News. So in 1920, it didn't make any difference who you voted for, you was going to get a guy from Ohio that was the owner and the editor of a newspaper. Now here's the crux of the whole thing. Vice presidential candidate for James Cox was who? Franklin D. Roosevelt. When they chose him, the party bosses said, what in the hell are you doing picking that young 28-year-old guy from New York? He ain't never going to amount to a hell of beans. <laughs> well, I guess they proved them all wrong. Because in 1932, when he took over in the White House, things changed. Things changed. Now, I have a lot of stories I want to tell you, but it is 10 till 8, and I'm starting to lose my voice. I will say one thing. <clears throat> about FDR. He used to drive me crazy. <laughs> he had two or three automobiles that had hand controls on them, you know, because he had that infantile paralysis. He couldn't use his legs. But that man had guts. He had fortitude. You know, the press, the press, unlike uh, uh, what you might think, they respected the office of the presidency and they respected him. He was never photographed in a wheelchair or with crutches. Never. If he was standing, he had his braces on. And those braces weighed about 60 pounds, 30 pounds on each leg. And for him to walk, he either had one of us on his side or one of his sons to keep him upright. But he never appeared in public in a wheelchair or with crutches. Never, ever, ever. But one thing about him and those damn cars, he used to drive us Secret Service people nuts because he liked to drive fast and he liked to drive alone, and he liked to drive up in the hills of New York and the mountains of Maryland, and it was all we could do to keep up with him. Now, one day, I'm a chasing him. He's up near Hyde Park. I'm a chasing him in my car with another agent with me, and he's just going up this mountain road like this. It's like no care in the world. He gets all the way to the top, and the road stops, and there's no way to turn that car around. Now, here's the President of the United States on a cliff, in a car, he ain't got no legs. <laughs> so I get out of my car and I said, Mr. President, you've done it to me again, only this time it's worse. <laughs> so I made him slide over and I had to jockey that car around so we could turn it around and get back down that hill. But he would do that to me all the time. <laughs> he would get in that car and take off and it was up to us to try and chase and keep up with him. Now I stayed on until Thanksgiving Day of 1944. Thanksgiving Day of 1944 was my last day of service with the Secret Service. And I went back to Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and I live there today. I just lost my mother not too awfully long ago, but I'm back in my home, the house that I was born in, and the house that I intend to die in. And I have a lot more stories that I could tell you, but we just ran out of time. I thank you very much. <laughs> If I don't know the answer, I just lie to you. Did FDR have a code name? They all had code names. And yes. why, how did they come about those code names? Well, normally it was chosen by the president or the first lady or a, a combination of the, of the two. Yeah. These was it alphabetical order? Like not necessarily, no. Necessary. Not necessarily, no. And, and there are things that, uh, as a Secret Service agent, you can't tell. So ask me, I might not be able to tell you. 
Thank you. Uh, the first one did, did you go to Warm Springs with him in the pool? Yes, oh, absolutely. Did you go swimming with well, him? Well, no, never went in the pool, but we okay. were always there. Either me or another agent, you know. Okay. Jensen and I, the two of us, were generally with the president, as I said, 24-7. Um, I did get a vacation every year. Normally took about a week off, went home to visit my mother and stay with her for a week. But other than that, we worked 24-7, 365 days a year. It was a it was a full time full time job, and and uh, when I went to work for when I went to work for uh, let's see I'm trying to think when I got my raise uh, I started I started at five dollars a day, and I think when when Kuwitz came in I got I got a raise to, I got six dollars a day, and when I left with FDR I was up to eight dollars a day. <laughs> yeah, so that wasn't bad, uh, not. Any kind of a pension to speak of, but uh, thanks to uh, FDR, we got Social Security. Yes, ma'am. You're pretty spry for a hundred something years old. I'm only now. I'm only seventy-two, honey. This is 1947. I don't know what year you're in, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I can still do it with the best of them. <laughs> Anybody else? Don't be bashful. Do you know what okay. famous person was on the Lusitania when they signed it? I'm sorry? Do you know what famous person was on the Lusitania when they signed it? If I did, I've long forgotten. Can you know Vanderbilt? Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt was on there? Grandson. Oh, grandson, yeah. Uh, I had a really good uh, a good friend of Teddy Roosevelt, and uh, <clears throat> William Howard Taft was on uh, uh, the Titanic when it sunk. A fellow by the name of Archie Butt. That's, that's, what we said. that's his real name, Archie Butt, B-U-T-T. Uh, he was, he was uh, 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 secretary for William Howard Taft in his administration. He was on the Titanic. Yeah. So. Yes, ma'am. Did you go to Paris with Wilson? Yes, I went everywhere with the president. Yes. Yeah, went to Versailles. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many things that you can cover. Now, I will say this. I wrote a book. <laughs> Starling of the White House. It published last year in 1946. Uh, I would encourage you to go buy it, look for it, search for it. Uh, it's a very good book. Uh, it's got a lot of story in it that I wasn't able to tell because of time constraints here tonight. But, How much does it cost? I don't know if we can afford it. Well, ma'am, I think it's like two dollars and ninety-five cents. But uh, I only get I only get a quarter of it. But every quarter helps, you know. Uh, but uh, I've enjoyed being here tonight. I thank you very much and. Uh, uh, if you got any other questions, I'll be around for a little bit. So. You want to tell us about the, the um, skinny dipping interview? Uh, oh, you mean uh, one, some of the earlier presidents? Yeah. Well, I am a presidential historian. I've always been interested in history. Uh, like I said, I never got a secondary education. I just graduated from Hopkinsville High School and went right into law enforcement. But I've always been interested in history, especially presidential history. And I was telling him earlier, you know, uh, <clears throat> You were talking about warm springs in a pool. A couple of our presidents, early presidents, liked to skinny dip in the Potomac. Uh, <clears throat> on the morning of his inauguration, John Quincy Adams slid down to the river in the morning and took a skinny dip before he was inaugurated president. He went down a few days later for his morning skinny dip, and a female reporter, which is really <laughs> different for that time period, but a female reporter from the Washington newspaper knew he was going to be down there. <laughs> so she snuck down there, hid his clothes, oh. so she could get an interview with him. <laughs> so she kind of had him by the short hair, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so she got the interview. Yeah, she got the interview. But there are so many stories like that that very few people know. Pets in the White House. There have been so many pets in the White House over the years. It's a fascinating. You can spend an afternoon just talking about pets in the White House. Teddy Roosevelt, probably the champion of all pets in the White House. They had everything. I mean, from snakes. Oh, one of the stories I got to tell. Do I have? Where's? I got a couple minutes yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's five to leave. It's way past my bedtime. Uh, <clears throat> Calvin Coolidge, when he was in the White House, he he of course he had Rebecca, his raccoon, but he also liked to raise his own chickens. So he had had a chicken coop built out on the East Lawn, and when they started harvesting the chickens, you know, putting them on the table to eat. Uh, they had kind of a minty taste to them. They couldn't figure out why. And uh, so they started doing some digging around, and they finally figured out that where they built that chicken coop, 
when when Alice Roosevelt was in the White House with her dad Teddy, she had a, a mint, a patch of uh, mint there, grown mint, you know, the foot in her tea, and the chickens was a pecking on the ground. <laughs> yeah, got that mint. Now Alice, Alice was another one. She, y'all know about Alice Roosevelt? She was a firecracker. She was a firecracker. She liked to sit on top of the roof of the White House and shoot pigeons with her 22. <laughs> oh, she was something else. Teddy Roosevelt once said, a reporter asked him about the duties of the president and how he handled his daughter. <clears throat> he said, I'll tell you something right now. I could be president of the United States or I could be a father to Alice Roosevelt, but I can't do both. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. You keep talking about just two agents two agents that's all that's all we had that's all we had in my day there were other agents but we were the detail that this was called the detail if you were the detail that meant you were guarding the president and there were only two of you yes yeah that's now when we would take if we if i got my week's vacation or if i sick i gotta tell you in 30 years i was never sick i never missed a day of work being sick never but if I was sick or if I'm on vacation, then another agent would be brought in to take my place. But we worked 12 hour shifts, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That was our job. What is it today? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> I've been gone for three years. So I don't know what they're doing now. I would assume that they probably are still working that way. Yes, sir. Was Churchill in the, office, in the yes. White House very often? Very During FDR's time, yeah. In fact, he, he dropped in a couple of times. He's kind of a freeloader. Yeah, he, he he liked to he liked to come and, and drink the president's liquor. He really did. But yeah, he was there quite a bit. Uh, he came during the war a couple of times, uh, begging for help, money, and you know that type of thing. Uh, of course, once we got into war, there was no problem. But yeah, yeah, he did. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed being here. I gotta ride that damn train back to Hopkinsville. <laughs> How are you, ma'am? Good to see you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Hope to see you.